absolutely not least, um, today is uh, the day after the official Veterans Day, but today is the day that our church is recognizing veterans. And so if you are a veteran, would you please stand? We would like to honor you. saying prepare the infrastructure 
so to speak. You guys know what I mean? So we are doing that, right? We've got our utes are being taken care of over here by momentarily, right? The utes, look at that awesome. I mean, we've got like a real program here, right? Momentarily. And um, they are taking care of our, our youth, and so that is super exciting. God brought them in to do that. That's growth. He's, he's God is preparing us. We're ready January 1. We're ready to open our home. People have said, we'll open our home. We'll teach. We'll disciple people. You know, this, this happened just last Sunday. And it's still a praise God. He's building infrastructure. Because he's not just going to flood us and crush us with people you know, that we can't care for. He wants a sheep care for. Right? Not just come on in and fill the place and nobody can take care of you. Okay? He wants to still care for the sheep. So, part of that, that's really cool. Um, God set up a Interesting, I'm sure it was just coincidental set of events, right? Nobody believes in coincidence here, I hope. Um, God set up a chain of events that allowed us to bring on an associate pastor. Um, this is a part time position, he's part time, just like all of us are part time. But one of the things that we needed because uh, so all of us are full time career people, right? We have separate careers, so we needed bandwidth to be able to reach into the church and to make sure we were caring effectively for people. So I want to introduce you guys to someone that God has brought this church, uh, which is going to be awesome. So you know who he is and what he does. He's going to be an associate pastor for us. So Dan and John, can you come up? And Gus and Alice, would you guys please come up here? Gus Richard and Alice Richard. Woo! Woo! Yeah. I want to make sure we have elders up here with us. Um, this is something that the, this is not just a decision I just made. This is a decision that the elders made. We all made together. Um, just so you guys know, you guys may not even know this about us. We I mean, don't know this about. We are an elder-led church. You guys know what that means? That means one person does not get to stand up and make decisions for everybody, and then say, "You have to do what I say." You guys get with that? Okay. I, I don't. That, that makes me nervous. When one person has all the power. So we have elders that we meet with and we make decisions together. You guys all right with that? It's not just me and John. No, there's, there's other elders. <laughs> He's not here right now, but it's okay. We have other elders that are not here. Um, Matt Homer, Ryan Wielden, and Roy Price. And they're also elders as well. So we just want to come up and support uh, Gus and Alice. Um, Gus has been in the ministry for a long time. Okay, He's been in a lot of significant ministry for many years. He has got a, he's got an amazing pedigree, he's got an amazing experience. Alice has been by his side the entire time. I've had a chance to meet them. I've had a chance to do ministry with them already, even inside this church. And they operate in a lot of very, very uh, powerful spiritual gifting. So we are lucky to have them. Uh, Gus and Alice, one of the things that I've seen is they are um, very dedicated and very attuned with spiritual healing, <laughs> which is a great skill set to have for your pastors, all right? which means they can sit down with you, they listen to the Holy Spirit, and they can help you get healed. Okay? This is something we practice inside this church. We want people free. Free people, free people. Hurt people, hurt people. Right? So these are people who free people. God uses them to free people. Okay? And that has been a big piece of why we want because they are going to be caring for people. We need people that can care for the sheep and that we are comfortable Caring for sheep, everybody good? Yeah. 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 Not just directing things, but like caring for sheep. So, Gus, I'd like to turn the mic over to you to address the congregation. Yeah. Gus Richard. Well, let me tell you, uh, Mike, uh, I've been going to share a few things. Uh, um, I'm a Cajun from Louisiana. No more <laughs> having <against me. laughs> uh, and I was ordained in the state of Louisiana, and I served there as an assistant pastor. Then I was called to a church in Arkansas, and uh, I served as a senior pastor there for a number of years. And at the ripe old age of 68, I was called to a church in uh, Florida to be an assistant because the senior pastor was in his 30s, and he was looking for someone older and had some experience. So my wife and I moved to Jacksonville uh, 
when I was 67, 68 years old, and I served there 12 years. So yes, I'm 80 years old. God yeah. bless you. Yeah. At this age, I'm just serving the Lord and yes. want people to be free Amen. To, Amen. to really worship Him and to love Him. Yes. And so I'm so pleased to be here. My wife and I are so pleased to be here and uh, being able to serve the Lord. Even at this age, I still can do that. So I thank the Lord. Yes, Alex, for being with us. Uh, and just so you guys know, Lynn Harper with Overflow Church. We are uh, we, we we work with Lynn, we work with Overflow. They're great folks, and they're the ones that actually help set this up. Um, Lynn actually came to me, and it was just a God thing. It was a God moment. So I'm so glad that Gus and Alice are here. Thank you guys for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Um, would you guys mind if we just pray? We just maybe hold out your hands, the elders. If you guys want to come around, Gus and Alice, please. And we're just going to pray together. So Lord God, we thank you, Father, for Gus and for Alice. And God, we thank you for the blessing that they are now, and they're going to be to this church. We thank you for the ministry they're going to bring and for the hearts that are going to be healed. We, we, we thank you in the head of, ahead of time in advance for the healing that's going to occur, the way they're going to care for the sheep. And Lord God, that there is so much ministry, <laughs> I believe, in this church for Gus and Alice. And we welcome them, Father. And we ask God that you cover them, anoint their steps, and God, that the enemy will be gone in the name of Jesus Christ as he tries to bring spiritual warfare to this couple. They would be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. They would be covered, Father, with our church. Amen. And Lord God, we pray and we cover them. Uh, Lord God, we ask, Father, uh, that as your anointing is upon them, that they would be safe um, and they, they, would, they would be protected, Father, in the name of Jesus as they minister in this house and that they're authorized to minister in this house. Yes. We thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Welcome to the family. Yes. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, guys, because this church is a family. Um, we'll talk about that today as we move forward. We want this to be a place of community, a place of family. This is important for us, and Gus and Alice will be part of that. So, you guys, you guys are great. Um, I feel like the church loves me well, loves my wife well. So, I ask that you would also love Gus and Alice well as well, as they they're going to be ministering to you and caring for you. That's going to be a big part of what they do. I know they're going to do that well. So, all right, I'm going to start today. We're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus and discipleship. All right, we're going to work on that today. So, there it is right there, ministry of Jesus and discipleship. <laughs> Our slides are getting so professional. I see Sheree like a blue background and white letters. <laughs> My PowerPoint is not good, and it always comes out looking like this, so praise God. I don't know how she does it. It looks way better. Okay, so God, we just want to pray right now. In Jesus' name, we give this service to you. Father, that whatever would be said today would be led by your spirit. Enemy, be gone. In the name of Jesus, away from these people's hearts and their ears. Go to the feet of Jesus or wherever he may send you. This building is not open to you. This ground is not open to you. For confusion and division and anxiety, and whatever, not being able to pay attention, be gone. In the name of Jesus. There's no curse. There's nothing that is going to stand on this property because of the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So we're going to start with the ministry of Jesus today. Um, here's what's important for us to know. All right. As a church, me, first of all, it starts with me. I have to be operating in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You guys okay with that? Listen, I do the seminary thing. It's awesome. As a matter of fact, I'm almost done. I'm getting so close. It's so cool and exciting. But I can tell you this. If I don't operate from the standpoint of the ministry of Jesus Christ in this church, I am not doing you a favor. Because we talked about it last time. You guys remember last Sunday, just a quick recap. We talked about gnosis. In the end, right, 2 Timothy 3, what's, what are people going to be like in the end? It's a big laundry list. You have to quote it. But lovers themselves. Wrath and lovers of God. And what are they gonna want? What are they gonna what are they gonna want? Second Timothy 3. You guys remember? They're gonna want something, they're gonna chase it. Flesh. Flesh, pleasure, but there's something else. They're gonna chase something. They're gonna have this. Knowledge. It's a knowledge. 
gnosis. The church, he's talking to the church, by the way. If you guys don't remember last Sunday, people will be chasing gnosis in the Greek. It means knowledge. They're going to have a form of usidia, which means godliness, which means they'll be reverent, they'll be pious, and they're going to be respectful. They're going to be good, good people in the church. Right? Chasing knowledge. This is really hard. What does Paul tell the spiritual son Timothy? Avoid such people. Does that blow your mind? Avoid such people. Because they're going to have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny the power of God. The dunamis power of God. In other words, I've got a ton of knowledge. I go to church every Sunday, I pack myself with knowledge. But it will never be able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. It's called epinosis. Research it. Epinosis. Gnosis is G-N-O-S-I-S, by the way. You're going to want to research it. Epinosis means the knowledge of the truth. Here's what it is. Take knowledge and turning it into application. <laughs> Taking your knowledge and applying it to make it real in your life. That is the issue. That's what God wants to do. So how does that work in his ministry? How did Jesus do this in his ministry? How did he bring application in his ministry? This is what we got to think about. Did he teach? Yes, he taught. Was he around large crowds or small crowds? Both. Yeah, he, it, was, it was everybody who would come. We'll talk about it a little later today. He was around everyone who would come. It was an all call. That's what I call it, the all call. Okay. <laughs> However, Jesus did something very, very different today that I want to talk to you guys about. The Jewish rabbis disciple people. Do you guys know that? So the word this discipleship is actually not something that Jesus started. It was actually already going on. What Jesus did, in my opinion, is he purified it. Okay. There was a discipleship process that the Jewish rabbis used. Basically, they were selected by people who were called Talmudim. Talmudim, sorry. Talmudim. Talmudim would select their teacher. The teacher didn't select them. You guys notice the difference there? Big difference. They selected the teacher. Guess how they selected the teacher? They would roll around through the best pitch that they could. They chased the knowledge and the best teacher they could find. You don't have to raise your hand or say anything. Some of you are smiling. Yes, it's happening today. They would find the best teacher that they could find. And they would fall up under the teacher. Here's what was missing. No life-to-life -life relationship. No life-to-life -life relationship. I am your teacher. <laughs> I'm giving you knowledge. And I'm preparing you to now be a teacher. That's how the system worked. That was it. Nothing else. When Jesus Christ came, he changed the system to something else. What did he add to it? Life. He went life to life with people. That's what he did. All right. If you guys don't mind, we're going to go to Matthew 28, 19 to 20. You guys have all heard this. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. What's this called? The Great Commission. The Great Commission. <clears throat> okay. Funny, Gus and I were talking about this, and Gus brought a really great point to me. He goes, Mike, that's not in the Bible. He's like, that was added, the word great. <laughs> Why is it better than any of the other commissions? You know how many commissions Jesus left? Multiple. What a great study, Gus, that you could do one day for the church. Multiple commissions that Jesus gave us, but this one is called great. This is right before he ascends into heaven. It's his last one. But I want you guys to understand something about this commission. This commission is after Jesus had come back, right? During the resurrection. Remember, he meets with the disciples and he grieves on them. And what does he say? You guys remember what he said? Receive, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, not everybody yet, but the disciples had received the Holy Spirit. Guys, if there's something I can tell you about this church, we have to do everything under the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you guys okay with that? Amen. It doesn't have to be kooky, weird. We're not talking about I'm talking about the Spirit of God must guide everything we do here. It has to. 
<clears throat> when I teach, when I preach, when I speak, I try, I'm not going to be Jesus, but I try to model myself after how he taught people, telling stories, using parables, putting things in your court. It really bothers people, I think, sometimes when they show up here and people are speaking in church because they answer the question. I'm sorry if that bothers you. You know Jesus did that? He began many of his sermons by you answering the question. Yes. We don't use that. <laughs> we don't use it because we're afraid, I guess, that people might get weirded out. I don't know. Whatever. But the bottom line is when people answer a question, many times that cracks things open for other people, yes. which leads to application. That's how Jesus did it. Instead of just packing their heads full of knowledge and then go, hey man, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> You got the knowledge. Get it done, right? Okay. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. I'm actually going to start in verse 18. Here's the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's key. Jesus said, listen, all authority has been given to me. And I'm asking you to do something. This is called the Great Commission. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to ask you to participate a little bit. Who has ever read the Great Commission and just thought... I get it. I know it's in the Bible. How do I do that? <laughs> Practically. Come on, be honest. Practically. How do I really do this? I mean, it's in the Bible. I mean, shouldn't you do like the Jerry Maguire thing? You can stand up and work. Who's with me? Who wants to be my disciple? Right? And some people just leave. You can leave the office together. Would that be a good idea? <laughs> no. Right? Disciples the word. Can you even ask someone to be a disciple? Doesn't that even sound hard? Has anybody ever done that? I've never done it. I've not done it, right? It's because it's just the way our society responds to it. But here's what he said. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Spirit. When we baptize, it is important. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay? All right. Teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, and behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. Baptize, teach to observe what he's commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, now let me ask you a personal question about discipleship and about the ministry of Jesus in your own life. You guys have worked, some of you already said, yeah, this is tough. I don't really understand how this works. The rest of you who understand it, maybe we have a tough time doing it. So don't put this in your court. What makes it hard to do this? Whoa, a lot of them. <laughs> all right, give me, give, me, give me one thing at a time. I need you vulnerability. Just, whoa, vulnerability. What does that mean practically for us? What do you mean by vulnerability? You have to live a transparent life to be willing to let somebody see into you, to walk out life with you, to practice close to yourself, and all the things that you deal with. You, know? you guys hear that one? Yes. I've got to be transparent. Sometimes when I preach, I probably say weird things for a preacher. I'm being who I am up here, guys. I'm sorry. I'm just being who I am. I'm being real with you. I'm letting you see into me. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not putting up a false front so I can be the teacher of all teachers. I'm being real. I'm letting you see into me. Your people have to be able to see into you. And if they can't see into you, they might still come here, but they will still lay in the back. Like, I don't know about this dude. I hear what he says, but I don't know. Right? And there's something in you that will just want to push away. Because Jewish rabbis did the opposite of what she just said, what Coral just said. Sorry, Coral. What Coral just said, they did the opposite. They hid themselves. That's why, remember when Jesus came, who did he light on fire? Was it people at the bar? No, he went to the bar. I'm not saying he was drinking. I'm saying he went to the bar to minister to people. Right? He lit the Pharisees on fire because they were fake. Yeah. They were teaching it and they were fake. <sighs> Get me fired up here in a minute for <laughs> They were fake. They were teaching, but they were fake. And let me tell you something. When you're fake in the ministry and you can't walk it out and you can't model the way Jesus Christ did, you will injure every sheep in, in, the, in the whole fold. Man. Yeah. You will injure every sheep in the fold and you won't mean to do it, but you will do it. Wow. 
God is who he is by who he is by us. Yeah. I didn't write this scripture down, I should have. I knew when I threw it last night, I didn't write it down. You guys might know where it's at. Basically, Jesus accused the Pharisees. He said, you will travel. This is a paraphrase. I'm so sorry. I did not write it down. You will travel across the whole world to make one proselyte. And then you'll teach that proselyte and he'll become more of a son of hell than you are. Go research it. Go research it. If you think Jesus didn't say that, he did. He said what she just said. He said what will happen is because you're so broken and you're not vulnerable and you're hiding, right? And when you teach... You're going to make that person twice the son of hell yeah. because he's learning something that's not real. Yeah. He's learning, there's a word, religion. <laughs> Hard word, right? You're teaching religion. That's what makes him twice the son of hell. Yeah. Tough. I don't think any of us are doing that here. I'm just saying she is 100% correct. Okay, vulnerability, transparency, huge. What else? Give me something else. What's the opposite? Intimidation. Okay, so with this, I want to add something to intimidation, because I think that is definitely a key word. Um, I, 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 what I feel like the Lord said to me to really share with you today kind of goes along the lines of what you just said, Mark. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Okay? I'm not necessarily afraid. I'm not prideful. But I'm overwhelmed with the thought of having to engage someone in my life at this level. Because there's just so much stuff going on in my own personal life. And I think it goes along with what you're saying. I don't know if I have the bandwidth for this relationship. I don't know if I have the bandwidth to do this with somebody else. This is going to require a lot of energy. And I really don't want people getting in my personal business and looking in my closets you know what I mean? I don't need you up in my house looking at my closet. That's spiritual. Go ahead, guys. What you got? Uh, I've had many people tell me that uh, I don't baptize and I don't teach. So that's the church's responsibility. Yes, sir. And not mine. Yes, sir. And that's the thing. But he's right. This is, this is actually something that's been believed. That the pastors and the staff... Um, I used to think when God started first calling me, I could hear his call, and I thought for sure he was telling me to quit my job and to go into full-time ministry. Anybody ever feel that feel like that? Like maybe God's telling me to do this? <laughs> there, there, there's some people in here that have felt like that, guys. And I'm telling you, most of the time, that's actually not the call. Right? It's not usually the call. Because we are the body of Christ, to Gus's point. We are the body of Christ. It's our job to do these things under the supervision of leadership. That's what the church is for. Oversight and leadership. You guys good? Hopefully it doesn't bother you. I, I don't baptize too many people. I usually ask other people to baptize. Because according to this, anyone can baptize. All right? And I would, I would love to see people on fire doing that, not turning it over to us. So, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Um, being overwhelmed with our life situation and circumstances. Does anybody feel the call for more, but it's just kind of overwhelming to engage that call? Anybody feel like that? Yeah. That's kind of a description? Yeah, like, I feel God saying more, but it's just the thought of it right now is so overwhelming because of the stuff in my own life. Or just whatever, just busyness. My kids, those types of things. I had to wrestle with that same thought, okay? When God said, start a church, and I've got a full-time career. And he didn't say, who should quit your job? And thank God I didn't, because we would be homeless. <laughs> okay? Like, seriously, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think you're going to see more and more churches as we go to watch our economy in bad shape. More and more churches are probably going to have more bivocational volunteers. It's totally cool. It's awesome. It was more of the original model anyway. But God had to get that through to me. I had to learn that and say, okay, I can still do this. I can still, we talked about last Sunday, taking 10% of whatever it is that I'm putting 90 into. <laughs> for me, it was work. Can you reallocate 10% for God? That's what we're talking about. That's part of this. Okay? Can you reallocate 10%? And we're going to pray about this today, too, because just the overwhelmingness of it sometimes creates unbelief. That I don't believe that God will make a bandwidth for me to do this. I can feel him calling, 
but he will not make a family. That's why it took me two years to say, yes, I'll become a pastor and start a church. And I really had a hard time trusting that he was going to give me that kind of family in my life. Okay. So I get it. I was there. Discipleship. Interesting word. Greek word is matatuyo. It basically means follow teachings, precepts, and instructions. Okay. However, Jesus added model. Modeling. Isn't that the hard part when I have to model it out for people and they have to be able to see it? Yes, it is a hard part. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do that. Okay. So, Let's start here. John 1, 12 to 18. That's probably up here. You guys can turn to if you like to. John 1, 12 to 18. <clears throat> I think what sometimes is frustrating about the Great Commission, about the ministry of Jesus, Jesus came, we're going to read the reasons why he came. Okay? I think sometimes we feel like he came for salvation, to get our ticket to heaven, and not to have a ticket to the bus to hell. Good reasons. I want to take it to heaven just like you did. But then he asked us to do the Great Commission, which means he also came so the Holy Spirit to come and empower you to do the Great Commission. This is important. And a lot of times this doesn't get touched because we just don't know how to do it. How do I do this? How do I engage my body to do this? But he wants to do this. What was the purpose of Jesus' ministry? Let's start there. John 1, 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only one, or sorry, the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me and ranks before me, because he was before me. Verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received, listen to this, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Talk about that one. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus Christ came, brought grace and truth, and he made God known to people. You guys get that? Because if he did not do that, all people would have, including us today, is the law. That's how we know people. Or know God, sorry. That's how we know God. And that is knowledge. Gnosis. Where we keep jamming our minds full of knowledge, but it doesn't really lead us to an understanding of the truth of who he is. That was one of the main reasons Jesus Christ came, one of the main ministry purposes. Salvation, rebirth, birth in the spirit, that you are born as a spiritual being, reborn. Grace, truth, and God made known, God made known, which is application. That's how we apply it. Alright? So, I want to run this past you. <laughs> Discipleship is so important okay, because of the fact that we are operating in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you are, this sounds tough, just bear with me. You are making God known to people when you operate in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Did you guys know that? Guys, I'm telling you right now, I've been, been, been in ministry not that long, but long enough to tell you a lot of people have a lot of knowledge. They do not know the Father. They don't know him. It's head knowledge. They don't know him. Discipleship is the process that allows us to know I sat with a man one time in an event, and it, I, this, this shook me. I never forgot this. I, I will never forget it. He said, Mike, I read the Bible every day, and I read it every year, cover to cover. I've been doing it for five years. I said, that's awesome. Would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? No, sir. Yes. I said, great. <laughs> <laughs> great. Right? Do you believe that that goes on? Yes. Wow. Yes. yes. A lot. I'm telling you guys, it's a head to gnosis, a head knowledge. He did accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. He yeah. did. He did. It took a little bit of time, but he came because he was afraid. 
You know why he was afraid to accept Jesus? Because he was going to get filled with the Holy Spirit and start doing weird stuff. He's like, I'd rather just read the book, man, and just figure it out myself. That's what he wanted to do. Read the book, figure it out himself. Don't fill me for the Holy Spirit, and I start doing weird things. Look at the disciples. They did some stuff. They broke away from tradition, okay? And he knew that was coming for him. But I need you to know, when we do that, when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us, start acting differently, and we follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you are bringing the Father into a personal nature for the people that you're with. You guys know that? If I can tell you anything that I want to see in here, us bringing God, right? Personal relationship with Jesus with people. That is really the great thing. If I can make it super simple, that's what the commission is all about. Helping people understand that. So as part of that, and part of that purpose, I want to cover this quickly. Freedom. Some people are like, I don't believe in that. That's fine. It's okay. But listen, <laughs> repentance and freedom, emotional healing, inner healing, is a huge part of discipleship. Yeah. That's why we offer it on Wednesday nights. Here we go. Here's the plug from Wednesday nights. <laughs> Wednesday nights. But that, that big sign outside, you know, like, it's kind of a weird sign. Are you hurting? <laughs> yeah, because you know what? I watch people drive. I'm just watching on a motorcycle. Me and Terrence literally still slow down. I was like, forget the sign. But you know what? That guy's hurt. I promise you he's hurt. Yeah. It spoke to him. It spoke to him. You know why? Because everybody experiences pain. Yes. We all hurt physically, spiritually, emotionally. Every one of us. That's why we got the sign out there. We want to bring people in. The first step is freedom. Your freedom is good first, and then theirs. Okay? You can lead them to freedom. Jesus came for the broken heart of Isaiah 61. He wants us to do that with other people. Because I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not free, and the person's not free, <laughs> discipleship becomes very religious. It's very, it becomes very harsh. So maybe, guys, I want to tell you that you've experienced that. And I want to say I'm sorry. If you have been in a uh, kind of a mentoring relationship with someone, and they put the law down on you, I'm sorry. Okay? I'm sorry that happened. That is not what's intended. Some of you, I believe the Lord is saying right now, come from backgrounds of this. Whether it be charismatic or non-charismatic. And you've had the law placed over you. That's wrong. The Pharisees did the same thing. That's wrong. I'm sorry. We don't want that. Okay. Let's move on. Luke 5, 27 to 32. I want to make this practical. Like, how do we practically do this in our lives? How can I walk this out? What's the application of the ministry of Jesus? If Jesus did it, he modeled it for us. How do we model it for other people in our life? Because God is telling us, after last Sunday, I'm telling you as the pastor of the church, what I'm hearing is this is time to begin a process of discipleship. House churches, groups, whatever God is doing. If it's, whether it's underappointed churches' direction, or maybe it's just you with people who are close. If we're just showing up on Sundays, listen to the message. I just don't think that's what God is saying. <laughs> I think He is saying, I want you to fully engage. Be mean to other people away from here. And maybe you're not being asked to do that right now, but you may be uh, being asked to join that right now. Join with someone who can walk you through. Here's the thing just someone who's a couple steps ahead of you. That's all it is. Someone's a couple steps ahead of you. They can help you. The call. Here's how the call works. Luke 5, 27, 32. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector, a tax collector sorry, named Levi, also Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, this is key, follow me. Follow me. You guys ever heard that? You ever heard that prayer? I have. I had a long time ago. Follow me. That's my first ask. This is the first ask. Follow me. This call goes to everybody. This is all call. Everybody gets this call. Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose, followed him, and Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors, and others reclining at the table with him, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, 
Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? <laughs> That's the best. And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, sign. <laughs> but those who are sick, right? Those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. And I tell you, you were a sinner called to repentance. Amen. Sometimes we forget. I forget sometimes. Not a sinner anymore. I'm righteous now. But I was a sinner called to, and so you, called to righteousness. Okay? Awesome. This is the all call. This is almost more of an evangelistic call, but it's also a discipleship call too. It says, come, follow me. So you're like, Mike, that's great. Jesus, Jesus was God incarnate. I mean, of course he did this with people who just came, of course. Right? Do you know he wants you to do the same thing? Once again, you don't have Jerry McGuire this day and stand up at work and say, who's winning? You know, you don't need to do that. Right? <laughs> but you can, through your life, through the modeling of Jesus Christ, you are in your sphere asking people to follow you. I'm going to give you this one. This will wake you up this morning. If you use the name of Jesus Christ, not in a family, in your daily day, your day to day transactions with people, you have just asked them to come follow you. You understand that? Yeah. There you go. And now look where you're at, right? Yeah. So I think that that's a big piece, okay, is hearing God's call. First of all, is the call. He gives the call. You've accepted the call. Now, when you go to work, when you, whatever you do in your life, you are putting out a call when you use Jesus' name. When you speak about your faith, you're putting out a call. Hey, come watch me. Remember the freedom thing we talked about? That's why we want to be free. <laughs> because that's that call. You're bringing people alongside of you. So I want you guys to all see that in the ministry of Jesus. He put out a call, we put out a call. Those who are well have no need of a physician. This, if you guys back up and you look at verse 30, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You know why they said that? Hopefully you know now from the start of the sermon. Right? Because their discipleship process was totally different. They did not mix or mingle that these people, they would never give them the time of day. Not the time of day. Jesus came and flipped the system and said, well, you know what? I'll go to them because they know they need me. Sick people want to be healthy yeah, right. more than anything. So I'll go to those people. I'll start there. That's who we gave the call to. Pharisees could not understand that. All right, let's go to the next selection of his disciples. So in your life, we have the call. The call goes out to everyone. All of you guys have a call. Pretty much everyone in here. If you're talking about Jesus, if you're ministering, you got a call. Come follow me as the call. Remember, modeling is part of that call. Modeling and teaching are part of that call. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Selection of disciples. I need you guys to hear me on this. Because there are some people who are sitting here in this room, and I think I'm, I'm one of them, so I'm preaching myself first. Selection of his disciples. Did you know that Jesus chose his disciples? Actually, he called them apostles. Can we read scripture? Those were the sent ones. We call them the 12 disciples. Those people, those men, were selected from a larger group. Okay? This is why, guys, listen to me in this. Please hear me. The click thing gets into churches. The enemy uses that word to divide churches into multiple factions that don't like each other. Or they're jealous, or they're rejected, or they're insecure. That is a spirit, and it ain't the Holy One. Okay? Jesus chose 12 from a group of at least 70, probably more. This is where it happened. You might be getting urged by the Holy Spirit to spend more time with particular people. And you may be thinking, if I do that, then I'm going to be a hypocrite. I'm creating a clique. 
I'm separating myself. Be careful with that one. If it sounds right, I don't know what that is. Because when we follow the ministry of Jesus Christ, he's selected some of us to watch. Luke 6, 12 to 16, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. All night. He did not sleep to do this. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, who named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And we selected a traitor. I think you knew it? Yeah. Yes, he absolutely knew the traitor was going to be with him. Okay. Let me say this to you. Let me make this applicable in your life. Is there anybody that's ever on your mind all the time? Yeah. Yeah. I got some bad news for you. <laughs> Listen. There is a call to discipleship that comes to all of us. Some people, the Father, the Holy Spirit is absolutely going to make it clear to you. They're great people, nothing wrong, but this isn't someone for you right now. Are you okay with that? If you will submit in prayer, and sometimes what will happen is we don't, and so we do this, well, it's from the world. It's silliness from the world. I don't want to hurt their feelings, and I don't want anybody to be hurt and to be upset, because well, I want to make sure we all get along. And people might think certain things of me if I say no, if I, if I don't engage with this person. Have you felt like that? Okay. But every time you go to engage with that person, something happens, and it's just like a war. It's like two rams. You know what I mean? <laughs> two rams going at each other. Okay. Maybe rethink the call to discipleship on that. Maybe we pray about it. <clears throat> I think God right now is saying, listen, there are specific people that I want you, that you are designed to reach, that you are designed to mentor, to draw close to, and to be close with. Okay? That's what Jesus did. He went and said, who are my twelve? So if you are feeling overwhelmed today, if you're overwhelmed with the concept of doing the Great Commission, let me tell you, go to prayer. Go to prayer and let him give you the names, give you the people. Who is it that he has set apart for you, for you to do this with? You'll see it clearly, guaranteed. All right, let's go to the last, last piece of this. Life to life ministry. Here it is. This is where we want to get to as a church. I wrap this up. This is where we're going. So there's a call. And there's a call for you to get close with certain people, which I hope you would take that to the Lord. As we make groups in here, don't just, you know, we're not just trying to make groups and put people together. Okay, you know what I mean by that? Hey, you 10, go over to such and such's house and do a DVD. Okay. <laughs> we're laughing because they've heard this. Be careful. Right? We are asking people to prayerfully consider who you're supposed to be with. All right, Luke 9, 57 to 62. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You hear something crazy about Jesus? He was homeless. That's what that says. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead and bury their own dead. <laughs> wow. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me say farewell to those of my home. Jesus said to him, no one puts his hands to the plow and looks back and spit for the kingdom of God. You know why Jesus said all this stuff? It sounds really mean, doesn't it? Like, how mean is this? How rude is that? Not mean and rude. Here's what he was saying. Count the cost. Because when you come with me, you get my entire life. Which means you have to assimilate into my life. I'm going to give you everything out of my life. My homelessness, my traveling, my teaching, everything. You're going to be with me. And he knew these guys could not submit to that process. Okay? That's why. That's the difference between Jesus and the rabbis. Do you have a little piece of your life that you can give to someone else? You have bandwidth, maybe 10%. Okay, let me encourage you. If you feel like you do not have that 10%, it is there. It's actually more than 10%, most likely. When you give that piece to God, okay, 
He is going to bless that piece tenfold. <laughs> he is going to bless that part that you give him tenfold. And those things that you're worried about now that are overwhelming to you will begin to go away. Seek ye first what? Seek ye first. Guys, this is one of the biggest problems I see. People are like, man, my house, I've got a mess. I've got this going on. This is a mess. This is a mess. My the stuff going on at home, my kids. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. Okay? They will all be added to you. All right, so let's pray because we wrap it up today. So, Lord God, we feel the call to discipleship in this church. We feel the call. We feel the call to divide up, to make groups, to do ministry in homes. God, to bring a relationship, a relationship with you through other people. Not just to hear the sermons, to hear the knowledge. But we feel the call to connect. That's what I hear. Life on life, connect. As we're praying, I'm just going to say this. There may be some of you who feel like to do this, I have to have a certain position or I have to do a certain thing. And it may feel almost like, what impact is this going to have? If I want to have an impact, I've got to do this. I've got to have a stage. I've got to have whatever that is. And I feel like he is saying, your impact is greater, life on life, than anything else that you can do. Open your home, open your life. So God, we, Father, we praise you, we thank you for this opportunity. And Lord God, we want to be a church that pursues you, that pursues relationship and discipleship. God, show us how to do it. I pray, Father, for the people who are sitting here right now and wondering, would you show a face? Lord God, in the name of Jesus, would you show a face to those who are sitting here if they're being called? If they're being called. Show a face of people they need to go to, to be mentored by, and show a face of people that you are calling up next to them, and that is what you are doing. If, that, if they're ready for that, Lord, we ask that you would do that. Father God, we know your spirit tells us all things. There are people who have led in the past. And God, I'm asking that you would empower them to lead again. Would you open doors right now in the name of Jesus Christ for people who have led in the past to lead again? So God, we go out today. <laughs> we go out today humbled by you, by your presence, by your commission. We would be a church that does the Great Commission, that cares for each other, that mentors and disciples. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. With one person I'd like to share before we go, I know it's 11 30. If you got to get your kids, please go ahead and get your kids. Um, but if anybody would like to share something of application for the message today, I'd love to hear it. Mike, I, I, the one thing I'd say is if, if you feel like God's calling you to disciple somebody, seek the covering of your elders. Yes. Um, there, there is. Uh, Paul called for us to have elders because there's an empowerment in the church that comes with that. Yep. Do so under their cover. Yes. Um, it, it'll protect you. It'll protect them. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah. We need that. Anybody else that would like to share? What is the application of this in your life? Can I accept it? Yep. Uh, we actually, the Lord allowed me to answer a question that I literally had in my mind. As we were talking awesome. for coffee, and it. it was in the in regards to discipleship, I felt uh, called to a certain uh, group of people, mm -hmm. and um, but felt like, oh, but I'm not out there speaking to or, or trying to disciple someone honestly right now that, that they're not saved, they're, they've not been called, in. and I'm with others. I've been called leaders, mm -hmm. but I felt guilty about it, mm -hmm. which is weird Interesting. because 
Shouldn't I be out finding the lost? Instead of focusing on go. where I feel called to. There you go. But I keep being drawn back to yep. and it leaves within our church, but even in the people that's outside the walls. And so you said that in the L and literally five minutes before you said it, I had the question. That's incredible. Am I supposed to do this? Or am I supposed to change it all? So I think um, would you just Martha be very quick and I can respond to that just by saying this. We are part of the body of Christ. Okay. So in other words, when Jesus left, he didn't say, you do my ministry exactly with everything. He was all five offices and every spiritual gift. You guys get that, right? Like he had everything. That would be very dangerous if he gave one person everything that he had. I'm telling you, that, that the flesh with that does not work. Too much. Too much power. We're the body of Christ. You guys get where I'm going with this? So what Debbie is, let's say Debbie is a hand. Her hand, the hand has a job to do. He's giving you the job. Just stay on that path until he changes it. Because we need the hand. You know what I mean? And somebody else is a kneecap. They do something different. All right? Not everyone is going to, um, I think, homeless ministry. I love it. It's great. Not everybody's going to go to homeless ministry. You might not feel that God's saying to do that. Um, there's other people. We're going to lead leaders. Other people are like, I don't want anybody in my home right now. Yeah. Or whatever that is, right? We all have a different task assigned, and I think it's important that we make that point. Everybody does not have to do everything. Um, we did ministry to foster kids. Very few people did that. That was something we did in the church. And I used to get frustrated. Like, Where's everybody at? And I thought to myself, not everybody's called to do this. This is something particular for us. So I just got to you know, roll with it, you know? Because we're all different parts of the body. Yes. So that's a great one. One of the things that I want to the next step, right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And God's going to take you through a process of that. He'll take you through a process. Um, and that is what the body of Christ helps you with. That process. Because what he wants is for you to be raised up and talk about your appointed. Right? Because you have an appointed ministry. He wants you to get there. And if you have a bigger ministry than anybody else, that's awesome. That's great. Right? <laughs> that's, that's what it's all about. Living above us. You know, something you have to do is know when to stop. Um, when you were talking, and what you were saying, I try to minister, you know, to a friend who was trying to be there, but the more I minister to her, the more she pulled me up. I'm sorry. So sometimes you just, you definitely have to be led by God to, to minister where you need to go. You, you need to just, it's not on your own free will. I want to tell you guys something that I just heard that is actually blew my mind. We are all subject to demonic oppression. Do you know that? Yes. Every one of us. Yes. I've had it on me. You're all subject. Don't think you're better, right? Okay, start there. Right. When someone is under demonic oppression, they are not ready for discipleship mm -hmm. at the level, okay? You will never out argue a demon. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't out advice them. You'll be trying to give advice, you'll be trying to argue, and you'll see it because it's just like, boom, boom. And you're like, I'm done. I'm walking away. And oh, God's saying to go back. Don't give up. Pray. I mean, this is spiritual warfare. We don't, you know, churches get a little bit smart, but spiritual warfare. Yes, yes. There is, you, you will never out argue with demonic oppression. Yeah. They've been around too long. They've seen too much. And they are in your flesh. They're more powerful. Okay? So we go with the Holy Spirit on that. Yeah. And sometimes he's going to say, you need to back up. <clears throat> you need to back up. You need to fast. Whatever it is, listen to him. A great point. He will give you the person that's ready for you. He will give that person to you. Anybody else? Awesome. Guys, thank you. Thank you for today. Um, and we're going to continue on with this this next seven week cycle. So I look forward to talking to you guys more. Um, Gus will be preaching for his first time. I'm so excited about that. So it's going to be awesome, Gus. Thank you. All right, guys, so uh, Lord God, we thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for the, the, the voices that were heard in here. Thank you for the message to us. 
And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bless this church with a ministry of discipleship. That this church will be open for people to grow. God, protect us from spiritual attack. I know people keep telling me this. Spiritual warfare has been so intense since I've been in this church. I know I'm sorry. That is because God is changing people. People are growing and changing here. So, Jesus, I ask that you protect us and that you continue to grow us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys, thank you. We've got some elders, Dan, and uh, John in the back. I'm up here to guess your prayer. We're here for you. That's an old name. It was hard to me, too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.